أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين السلام عليكم dear brothers and sisters ورحمة الله وبركاته and welcome to another episode of the life of Prophet Muhammad so in our last session we were speaking about the events leading up to the Battle of Hunayn. If you recall, after the conquest of Mecca, there remained two tribes that posed a threat to the Muslims. And they are the tribes of Thaqif and Hawazin. Now, Banu Thaqif, of course, their base as we mentioned, uh, was in Ta'if. And the Hawazin uh, were essentially the largest Bedouin tribe that lived outside of the, the city of Mecca. Now, with the defeat of Quraysh and the mass conversion of many of the uh, Qurayshis, what you find is uh, Banu Thaqif and Banu Hawazin, they refused to surrender to Islam. In fact, the Banu Thaqif, they wanted to seize control of Mecca because it was uh, an important uh, capital of paganism. So with the, with the conquest of Mecca, Ta'if became the, the center of paganism. And for generations, uh, Banu Thaqif and Quraysh, they were rivals. So this was an opportunity for Banu Thaqif to keep the tradition of their forefathers alive and to seize control of the Kaaba and become the new custodians of the, the Kaaba. So now there is a battle going to take place. A battle between the forces of monotheism and paganism. The Prophet ﷺ assembles an army of 12,000 fighters. However, with Banu Thaqif and uh, Banu Hawazin, they reach out to some of the smaller tribes and they form an alliance. And their numbers swell to 20,000. So, the Muslims now, under the leadership of the Prophet, they're preparing for this uh, military confrontation. Now, as the Muslims are moving towards the Valley of Hunayn, something interesting happens. And this is reported by Ibn Ishaq, who reports from Abu Waqid al-Layfi. This individual, he says, كانت كفار قريش ومن سواهم من العرب لهم شجرة عظيمة خضراء. Abu Waqid al Layfi, he says, and presumably, you know, he's with the Prophet, he's among the companions. He says, the believers from Quraysh, the disbelievers, the disbelievers, the mushrikeen of Quraysh, and other pagan tribes, they had a great green tree that they had named that Anwat. Yuqalu laha that Anwat. It was a hanging tree. Yatunaha kulla sana. The pagans they used to go to this tree once a year. What would they do? The narration says, "Fayyuallikuna aslihatahum alayha." They would hang their weapons on this tree. عندها, they would sacrifice uh, animals to it. يوماً, and they would spend an entire day performing some sort of religious festival around this massive hanging tree. قال, so Abu Waqid al-Layfi, 
He says that as we were traveling with the Prophet ﷺ, as we were going towards the Valley of Hunayn, he says, فَرَأَيْنَا وَنَحْنُ نَسِيرُ مَعَ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَآلَى سِدْرَةً خَضْرَاءَ عَظِيمًا As we were traveling, we saw a massive green tree. فَتَنَادَيْنَا مِنْ جَنْبَاتِ الطَّرِيقِ So we started to call out, you know, from you know, the side of the road that we were on. We called out to the Prophet. يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ اجعل لنا ذات أنواط. They said, O oh Messenger of God, why don't you make for us a hanging tree just as the mushrikeen have a hanging tree? Right? And they did this for good luck. Right? You know, when, when, when the mushrikeen would go to war, oftentimes they would, at least once a year, right, they would go and perform these rituals. Right, the mushrikeen were very superstitious. So you have a contingent of the companions of the Prophet Of course, many of them were new converts to Islam. So they asked the Prophet, make for us a hanging tree, just like the mushrikeen had their hanging tree. Now what was the reaction of the Prophet? You, know, you can imagine the Prophet spent almost two decades preaching the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you know, striving to eradicate these superstitions and these silly practices. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, he reacts emphatically. He says, قَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ فَقَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ اللَّهُ أَكْبَرُ اللَّهُ أَكْبَرُ اللَّهُ أَكْبَرُ He recites the takbir three times. And then the Prophet says to them, قُلْتُمْ وَالَّذِي, بنفسي والذي نَفْسِي بِيَدِهِ كَمَا قَالَ قَوْمُ مُوسَى لِمُوسَى The Prophet says, You are asking me a question that the Bani Israel asked to Musa. The Qur'an tells us that when the children of Israel, when they were crossing the Red Sea, with Musa السلام, after the miracles that they witnessed, they passed by a, a village, a city, in which the people were worshipping idols. So Bani Israel, they turn to Musa. They say, Ij'alna. The Quran mentions this in Surah Al-A'raf, Ayah 138. They turn to Musa and say, Ij'alna ilahan kama lahum alia. Oh Musa, make for us a god, just as they have gods. Can you craft and make an idol for us? So the Prophet ﷺ, he's basically saying to some of his companions that you're asking me the same audacious question that Bani Israel asked of Musa. The Prophet says that this is, you know, he's essentially saying that subhanAllah, history repeats itself. Indeed, you will follow the ways and the customs of the generations that came before you. And we have a hadith about this, how the Muslims will end up making the same mistakes as their predecessors, the religious communities of the past. So here is one example of the Muslims essentially asking the Prophet Sallallahu to make, to designate a tree that they can derive barakah from, a tree that can give them good fortune. You know, this is basically a type of idolatry. Now some important lessons that we learn from this narration is that Muslims should avoid superstitious rituals because many of the superstitious rituals that people engage in especially muslims they constitute a form of shirk it's a form of polytheism you know for example you know you go to some you go to people's houses and they have on top of their door they have 
a blue eye. And you ask them, what is this? And they say, Shaykh, this is to protect us from envy, from the eyes of people. This is a type of, if, if someone really believes that this is going to protect you from the people, from the eyes and the envy of people, this is shirk. Allah is the protector. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the protector. Now, why, why is it even a blue eye? Why does it have to be a blue eye? Are we going to also add you know, blonde hair to this blue eye? Muslims need to be aware of these things that are antithetical to the teachings of Islam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He is the giver and He is the one who takes. Allah is the provider and He's the protector. So if anyone believes that these things can do anything independent of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then this is a form of polytheism, a form of shirk that has to be avoided. So this is number one. Muslims need to be vigilant. And Muslims should never engage in anything that is superstitious. Right? One of the objectives of the Prophet was to eradicate superstitious practices. And it's very sad that in our day and age, Muslims voluntarily engage and participate in holidays that are entirely based on superstition. Right? For example, you have Halloween, even December 25th being Christmas. This has no basis in reality. Right? So Muslims need to pay attention to the practices that they engage in. So this is number one. Number two is when we hear or see something offensive, right? the companions, some of the companions were essentially asking the Prophet to allow them to perform an act of shirk. Now, how does the Prophet respond to blasphemous acts? How does, what does he do? He doesn't use vulgar language. He doesn't use crude language. The Prophet ﷺ, he responds by mentioning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, reminding those who are you know, inclined towards deviant behaviors. He reminds, of, he reminds them of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The way that you guide people is you don't verbally abuse them. You don't really ridicule them. You guide them. You remind them. You draw their attention to their mistake. Right? Number three, the Prophet ﷺ, he makes a distinction between an act of shirk and a mushrik. Right? Muslims may do things that constitute shirk. And oftentimes they do it unknowingly. The Prophet Sallallahu he didn't turn to his companions and say, you guys are mushrikeen, you know, for making this request. No. We have to be very careful about labeling people as mushrikeen. Especially if they're, you know, if, they're, uh, if they are Muslims and they might not be aware of the consequences of these actions. Right? So we have to be careful with these labels. It's possible for a Muslim to perform an act of shirk, but that doesn't take them outside of the fold of Islam, especially if it's based on a misunderstanding or you know, a lack of knowledge or you know, some sort of confusion. And number four, following the religious traditions of others and abandoning Islamic traditions is forbidden. So we've already alluded to this. We have to be vigilant and cautious, right? We should not celebrate non-Islamic holidays in a way that violates the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So sometimes you have people that they'll celebrate Valentine's Day and they'll end up committing haram on Valentine's Day. They'll celebrate Christmas and they'll go to a party where there's music and dancing and they'll be sitting with people who are drinking alcohol and wine. Muslims should not be followers of the traditions of others. Muslims should be the role models. Muslims should not have an inferiority complex where they want to mimic non-Muslims. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed you with guidance, with hidayah. You should be a beacon of light and inspiration and enlightenment for others. It shouldn't be others are influencing you. So, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, he, he rebukes 
some of his companions. And he reminds them of the importance of Tawheed and not believing that protection or good fortune comes from anyone other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the Muslims, they arrive at the valley of Hunayn and they arrive there at night, at the time of Isha. They pray Salatul Isha. A group of companions are dispatched to survey the army of the Mushrikeen and to come back to the Prophet and give him basically a comprehensive report regarding their, their numbers and their weapons and their supplies and so on. So upon returning to the Prophet, they tell the Prophet, Ya Rasulullah, the, the army of the Mushrikeen has an abundance of livestock. They brought all of their possessions. In fact, they also brought their women and their children. We saw women and children among the ranks of the Mushrikeen, of Thaqif and Hawazin. So the Prophet ﷺ, upon hearing that Banu Thaqif and Banu Hawazin and the smaller pagan tribes that had joined, they brought their possessions with them. And it seems that they did this to kind of show that, you know, we're willing to put everything on the line. That's how confident we are in our military strength. The Prophet, upon hearing that they brought all of their property with them, he smiled and he remarked, تِلْكَ غَنِيمَةٌ لِلْمُسْلِمِينَ غَدًا إِن شَاءَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى The Prophet, he said, that that will be the spoils for the Muslims tomorrow, God willing. Meaning that these, the, they made the job easier for us. Whatever they've brought, it will come into our possession and we will own it through. We will own it as spoils of war. Now, Banu Thaqif, they had an advantage over the Muslim army. They were familiar with the terrain of the valley, the valley of Hunayn. They knew it very well. They knew the landscape. And they knew exactly where to position themselves to gain a tactical advantage over the Muslim army. So what they ended up doing is that they stationed a small group of fighters at the end of the valley that the Muslims must cross. And they basically stood there, a contingent of them, they awaited the Muslims to attack. Now Hawazin, they took up positions in the valley and many of their fighters, they hid in its many hollows. You know, so they were hiding in the caves and the ravines and they had a plan to attack the Muslims at once from all sides. They wanted to bombard them. So they didn't want a face-to-face -face battle with the Muslims. Right? They wanted to assault them from every angle. And the terrain and the landscape of uh, the valley uh, made that easy and made that possible. So the Muslims, they march into the valley of Hunayn and Khalid ibn al-Walid, he leads at the helm of Sulaym, you know, the, the, the tribe of Sulaym, which is a smaller tribe within the, the army of the, the pagans, Banu Sulaym. So he leads them and he leads some of the new Meccan con converts behind them. Now again, these new converts Many of them, you know, did not submit and join Islam, you know, with strong conviction. They basically surrendered to a, a more powerful force, which was the Prophet. You know, many of them were, were hypocrites. You know, they basically um, were hoping and maybe potentially even waiting for the Prophet ﷺ to fail. So not all, we can't say that these new Muslim converts were, you know, like the the Muhajireen and the Ansar, those who had a history with the Prophet. So Khalid and his contingent, his men, they were lured into the battle. They were, they were lured into the valley 
And that small contingent of the Hawazin, they fled. So when they fled, this encouraged the Muslims to pursue them. Encouraged more Muslims to enter into the valley. Now what ends up happening is that, and this was a, a, a military tactic by the Mushrikeen. They wanted, they pretended to run away so that the Muslims would chase after them. So once all the Muslims entered the valley, a bottleneck was formed. So you have the Prophet's army, which is 12,000. So they're all streaming in to this valley. You know, they see the Hawazin, they, they retreat. So now they're lured into this valley. What ends up happening is that at that moment, when the Muslims were in the valley, and that bottleneck and that congestion was taking place, archers jumped out of the ravines and they began to shower the Muslims with arrows. So you can just imagine the Muslims are traversing this narrow passage in the valley of Hunain. Suddenly from above, they see that it is now raining. They're being showered by arrows. 20,000 pagan fighters, they descend into the valley and of course because of how tight it was, how congested it was, the Muslims panic. It was absolute pandemonium. The Muslims panic and they begin to scatter. One report in, by Al-Waqidi, he says that Sulaym, the, the Banu Sulaym, that were being led by Khalid ibn al-Walid, they were related to Hawazin by their mother. And for this reason, many of them, they hesitated to engage and to fight the Hawazin because after all, they're relatives, they're family. So they didn't have the motivation to fight against Hawazin. So you have that coupled with the, the attack that came towards the Muslims from all sides. Shaykh al-Mufid, rahmatullahi alayhi, he writes in Kitab al-Irshad, فَلَمَّا الْتَقَ الْقَوْمَ مَعَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ لَمْ يَلْبَثُوا حَتَّى نَهَزَمُوا بِأَجْمَعِهِمْ When the Muslims encountered the pagans in the valley of Hunayn and the mushrikeen attacked them from all sides, everyone retreated. The Muslims retreated. There was a mass retreat. فَلَمْ يَبْقَ مِنْهُمْ مَعَ النَّبِيِّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَآلِهِ إِلَّا عَشَرَةُ أَنْفُسِ There were only 10 people that remained steadfast besides the Prophet. Imagine, out of 12,000 Muslims who were with the Prophet, they all retreat except for 10 people. In that moment of hysteria and confusion and terror, there was a stampede. Everyone is running and escaping. There are only 10 who were concerned about the safety of the Prophet. Everyone was just trying to escape to save themselves. Now among the 10, Shaykh al-Mufid, he says, Tis'atun min bani Hashim khasa. Nine out of the ten were Hashemites. They were from Bani Hashim, the family of the Prophet. Wa'ashiruhum Ayman ibn Um Ayman. And the tenth of them was Ayman, the son of Um Ayman, who was the Prophet's foster mother. The son of the Prophet's foster mother. فَقُتِلَ أَيْمَنْ رَحِمَهُ اللَّهُ Ayman was killed in the battle of Hunayn. وَثَبَتَ تِسْعَةُ النَّفَرَ الْهَاشِمِيُّونَ The nine Hashemites, they remained alongside the Prophet. They were firm. حَتَّى ثَابَ إِلَى رَسُولِ اللَّهِ مَنْ كَانَ هَزَمْ Until later on, the Muslims came back. 
the Sahaba, they started to come back to the Prophet. فَرَجَعُوا أَوَّلًا فَأَوَّلَ حَتَّى تَلَاحَقُوا وَكَانَتِ الْكَرَّ لَهُمْ عَلَى الْمُشْرِكِينَ When the Muslims regrouped after that initial panic, they gained victory over the, the pagans. So they returned, you know, one by one after initially retreating and they were able to, to defeat the mushrikeen. Now, we, what we see is that some of the women who had accompanied the Muslims, they stood firm. So there were women, they didn't join the Prophet to fight. They were there for, for moral support. And narrations tell us, the historical accounts tell us that among the women that played the role of being a motivator and she, she was present to give moral support to the Muslim army was a woman by the name of Nusayba bin Tukab al Mazaniya. And she was among the women who stood firm in that moment of panic and she chastised and rebuked the deserters. And she even threatened them. You know, those who were running away from the Prophet, she rebuked them, she shamed them, and she even threatened them. وَكَانَتْ نُسَيْبَ بِنْتُ كَعَبْ الْمَازِنِيَّةِ تَحُثُّ فِي وُجُوهِ الْمُنْهَزِمِينَ التراب. You know, she would grab dust and she would throw it into, she would throw it at the face of the Muslims who were running away to punish them, to shame them. She would say, where are you going? To where are you retreating? Are you running away from God? Are you running away from the Messenger of Allah? Are you abandoning your duty? Are you abandoning Rasulullah? I know this is sensitive, a sensitive point here, but this is history. We cannot distort history to preserve the feelings of people. This is, his, this is what the historical accounts say. Among those who deserted was Umar ibn al-Khattab. Was Umar ibn al-Khattab. وَمَرَّ بِهَا عُمَرْ فَقَالَتْ لَا And she said to Umar, وَيْلَكْ مَا هَذَا الَّذِي صنعت? She says to him, what are you doing? Why are you running away? فَقَالَ لَهَا هَذَا أَمْرُ اللَّهِ He said, this is the decree of God. We can't win. It's the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Putting the blame on Allah azza wa jal. You ran and the others ran out of their own volition, out of their own free will. So the Prophet ﷺ, he calls back the army. Shaykh al-Mufid, again, in, in Kitab al-Irshad, he says, وَلَمَّا رَأَى رَسُولُ اللَّهِ هَزِيمَةَ الْقَوْمِ عَنْ When the Prophet saw that his, that his people, that the Muslims, his companions, were running away. قَالَ لِلْعَبَّاسِ وَكَانَ رَجُلًا جَهْوَرِيًّا صَيِّتًا The Prophet, he turns to his uncle, Al-Abbas. And Abbas was a man who had a very loud voice. The Prophet said to him, نَادِ فِي الْقَوْمِ وَذَكِّرْهُمُ الْعَاهِدِ Rasulullah says, Oh my uncle, call the people, call the Muslims, call my companions, and remind them of the covenant that they made. They made a covenant with me, that they would fight, they would defend Islam, that they would not abandon the cause of Islam. What are they doing? Imagine that scene, brothers and sisters. 
Al-Abbas standing in the middle of the valley of Hunayn. Arrows are showering upon the Muslims. The majority of the Muslim army is retreating. And he shouts out by the command of the Prophet, Ya Ahla Bay'at al-Shajara. He reminds them of the covenant in Hudaybiyah. Oh, the ones who gave, who pledged allegiance at the tree. Ya Ashab Surat al Ya Ashab Surat al Baqarah. Ila Aina Tafirun. He says, O oh people, O oh men of Surat al Baqarah, where are you fleeing? أذكروا, أذكروا Remember the covenant that you made with the Messenger of God, that you would be steadfast, that you would fight to defend Islam. And it's interesting that he refers to the companions as Ashab Surat al Baqarah. Now, why Surah Al Baqarah among all the surahs of the Quran? It's because, and this is one of the, the possible meanings, is that Surah Al Baqarah is a surah in the Quran that mentions the covenants that the Muslims make. Allah speaks about the covenants that Bani Israel made to Musa, alayhi salam to the other prophets that came before him. And similarly, there are a lot of verses in the Qur'an that speak about upholding the covenant of God. So he says, you are the people of Surat al-Baqarah. Surat al-Baqarah mentions the covenants that you have to uphold, that you have to honor. Have you forgotten the ayat of Surat al-Baqarah? وَكَانَتْ لَيْلَةٌ وَالْمَاءٌ It was a dark night. And it seems that the Muslims, they were in the valley. It was at night. Pitch black. وَرَسُولُ اللَّهِ فِي الْوَادِي وَالْمُشْرِكُونَ قَدْ خَرَجُوا عَلَيْهِ مِنْ شِعَابِ الْوَادِي وَجَنْبَاتِهِ وَمَضَائِقِهِ So, Shaykh Al-Mufid, he writes here that it was a pitch black night. And the Prophet was in the valley. The pagans came against him from the mountain passes into the valley and from the sides of the valley and its narrow ravines with their swords drawn. And they were holding clubs and stones. فَنَظَرَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ إِلَى النَّاسِ بِبَعْضِ وَجْهِهِ فِي الظَّلْمَاءِ فَأَضَاءَهُ كَأَنَّهُ الْقَمَرُ لَيْلَةُ الْبَدْرِ The Prophet in that dark night, he would look towards the people, he would look towards his companions, and even though it was night, his face, his face was illuminating. He gave light as if his face was the moon, as if it, his face was the moon on the night of a full moon. ثُمَّ نَادَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ أَيْنَ مَا عَهِدْتُمُ اللَّهَ عَلَيْهِ The Prophet also reminded the companions. Where are you who gave your pledge to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So Al-Abbas is calling out. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi is calling out. فَأَسْمَعَ أَوَّلَهُمْ وَآخِرَهُمْ the first of them and the ones who were far heard. They heard the words of the Prophet The voice of the Prophet reached those Muslims who were in close proximity and the Muslims who had also already gone far. The, the echoing of the voice of the Prophet, the voice of Al-Abbas, it reverberated. And they, those Muslims who retreated, they could hear that call. What happened to the covenant? What happened to the covenant you made with Allah? فَلَمْ يَسْمَعْهَا رَجُلٌ إِلَّا رَمَى بِنَفْسِهِ إِلَى الْأَرْضِ Not a man of them heard that call, but did not fling himself to the ground and crawl. 
When they heard the Prophet, they threw themselves on the ground, presumably to protect themselves from the, the arrows. And they started to crawl back into the valley where they were initially. فَانْحَدَرُوا إِلَىٰ حَيْثُ مَا كَانُوا مِنَ الْوَادِي حَتَّى لَحِقُوا بِالْعَدُوا فَقَاتَلُوا So the Muslims, they start crawling back into the valley to go, to get back to where the Prophet is standing. And they ended up meeting their enemies and they fought against them. The Prophet ﷺ, in the middle of that chaos, he makes a dua. ثُمَّ رَفَعَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَآلِهِ يَدِهِ رَفَعَ يَدِهِ The Prophet raised his hands in dua in the middle of the battle. فقال اللهم لك الحمد O oh Allah, to you belongs all praise. وَإِلَيْكَ الْمُشْتَكَى And to you do we direct all of our complaints. وَأَنْتَ الْمُسْتَعَانَ And you are the one who gives help. فَنَزَلَ جُبْرَائِيل Jibra'il descends upon the Prophet. فَقَالَ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ دَعَوْتَ بِمَا دَعَى بِهِ مُوسَى حَيْثُ فَلَقْ حَيْثَ حَيْثُ فُلِقَ لَهُ الْبَحْرِ Jibra'il says, Ya Rasulullah, the dua that you just made now is the same dua that Musa made when he split the Red Sea. In that moment of panic, when Fir'aun and the forces of Fir'aun were behind him, when they were pursuing him, and the Red Sea was in front of him, he made this dua. When Najahu min Fir'aun, it is through this dua that Allah saved Musa alayhi salam and Bani Israel from the tyranny of Fir'aun. ثم قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله لأبي سفيان ابن الحارث The Prophet, he turns to Abu Sufyan and he says to him, ناولني كفا من الحصى The Prophet, he turns to Abu Sufyan and he says, hand me, give me a handful of pebbles. فَنَاوَلَهُ فَرَمَاهُ فِي وُجُوهِ الْمُشْرِكِينَ ثُمَّ قَالْ شَاهَةِ الْوُجُوهِ The Prophet takes these pebbles and he throws it at the mushrikeen. And he makes a dua that may your faces be condemned. ثُمَّ رَفَعَ رَأْسَهُ إِلَى السَّمَاءِ وَقَالْ The Prophet then raised his hands in dua again. And he said, he's speaking to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allahumma in, in tahl, in tahlak hadhihi al-isaba lam tu'bad. The Prophet says, oh Allah, if this group, if we perish in this battle, lam tu'bad, you will not be worshipped. This is the same, similar dua that he makes in the battle of Badr. That we are the forces of Tawheed. وَإِنْ شِئْتَ أَنْ لَا تُعْبَدْ لَا تُعْبَدْ And if, if you don't want to be worshipped, if it's not your will to be worshipped, then allow us to perish. So he, he makes this heartfelt dua, saying that, Ilahi, we're the only ones who worship you as you want to be worshipped. So for the sake of our Iman, for the sake of the Tawheed that we uphold, Protect us. Give us victory over our enemies. And the Prophet ﷺ, he began shouting at the pagans. The Prophet was on the front lines. He was in fighting in this battle. He says, أَنَا النَّبِيُّ لَا كَذِبٍ أَنَا عَبْدِ الْمُطَّلِبٍ He says, I am the messenger. No lie. I am the son of Abdul Muttalib. Imagine what a great personality Abdul Muttalib was that the Prophet, he introduces himself as the son of Abdul Muttalib. In our earlier episodes, we spoke about the merits and the virtues of, of Abdul Muttalib. So as each tribe was called by name, the Prophet, he was calling and summoning 
the the Muslims, you know, from the various tribes, he would tell them to come back, and they all returned. They be, they came back rushing to the Prophet, sallallahu alaihi wa and they said essentially, "Labbaik ya Rasulullah, we're here, O Messenger of God." So as the Muslims returned after their initial retreat, they rallied around the Prophet, sallallahu alaihi wa and of course. Just like with all of the battles, Amir al-Mu'mineen salam was there. He was among the few who did not retreat. For Amir al-Mu'mineen, the priority is to save the life of the Prophet before saving his own life. But who is like Amir al-Mu'mineen? Who is like Ali ibn Abi Talib in his altruism, in, his, in how protective he is of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. فَقَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وآله الآن حمي الوطيس. When the the Muslims return and they rally around him, the Prophet says, "Now the real battle has begun. Now the battle has begun." In the beginning, they were a bit shaken, but he could see that there was a renewed resolve and determination. The Prophet ﷺ, what we see, being the wise leader that he is, he appealed to both the religious and the tribal loyalties in that critical moment. There's one report that says, فَالْتَفَتَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ إِلَىٰ أَبِي سُفْيَانْ ابن الحارث. The Prophet, he turned towards Abu Sufyan, who was standing close to him. وَهُوَ مُقَنَّعٌ فِي الْحَدِيدِ The Prophet, the Abu Sufyan was wearing an, an iron, he was wearing an iron helmet. His face was covered. فَقَالَ مَنْ هَذَا The Prophet said, who are you? فَقَالْ إِبْنُ عَمِّكَ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ I'm your cousin, O Messenger of God. So even, you know, in that moment, you see that maybe, you know, Abu Sufyan was not fighting for religious reasons, but there was a little bit of you know tribal loyalty in that moment because at the end of the day, Banu Thaqif and Hawazin they're not Quraysh. You know, yes, Abu Sufyan has his differences. He, he's not a friend of the Prophet, but at the end of the day, he's 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 a part of the, our our tribe. He's from Quraysh. He's my cousin, and these are outsiders. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He granted His help to the Muslims in Hunayn. Allah azza wa jal, He says, ثُمَّ أَنزَلَ اللَّهُ سَكِينَتَهُ عَلَىٰ رَسُولِهِ وَعَلَىٰ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ Then God sent down His tranquility upon His Messenger and upon the believers. This tranquility is important. If you are panicked in battle, you're not going to do well. You're in a vulnerable position. You can easily be targeted by your enemies. To be efficient in battle, it requires calmness. And this sakina, it comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah gives it at these critical moments. ثُمَّ أَنزَلَ اللَّهُ سَكِينَتَهُ عَلَىٰ رَسُولِهِ وَعَلَىٰ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَأَنزَلَ جُنُودًا لَمْ تَرَوْهَا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not only does He infuse tranquility into the heart of the Messenger and the hearts of the believers, Allah says, I sent down forces whom you did not see. Yes, the pagans have 20,000 fighters and the Muslims have 12,000. Yes, that's what you see. But what you don't see are the throngs of angels who have descended to support the believers. وَعَذَّبَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا وَذَلِكَ جَزَاءُ الْكَافِرِينَ And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala punished those who rejected. And this is the recompense of the disbelievers. So the Banu Thaqif and Hawazin Steadfast in their initial strategy, they found themselves challenged 
when the Muslims resiliently countered their assault. Yes, initially, the Thaqif and Hawazin, they had the upper hand. They caused the Muslims to panic. But the Muslims, they ended up regrouping. And much, if not all of the credit, really goes to Amir al-Mu'mineen, who restored the morale of the Muslims, remained and killed a number of the Hawazin. So overwhelmed by the unexpected resistance, the Mushrikeen, they now, they succumbed to panic and they hastily retreated. So sensing the urgency of the moment, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, he directs some of his companions to chase, to chase the fighters of Thaqif and Hawazin through the winding valleys to ensure that they do not reassemble for a counter-offensive. And this crucial directive of Rasulullah, it proved pivotal. It thwarted the pagans' recovery and caused them to disperse and scatter. And the Prophet ﷺ, after this, he strategically dispatched a number of smaller groups in various directions to subdue the various sub-tribes to ensure a complete and all-encompassing triumph and victory. Now, unfortunately, as, as it occurs in many military conflicts and battles, you have civilians who are killed, unfortunately. So the Aus and the Khazraj, so these are the two major tribes among the Ansar, they went overboard in the Battle of Hunayn and they ended up killing women and children. Now when news reached the Prophet ﷺ that there were women and children who were killed, Rasulullah didn't make excuses for his companions. The Prophet speaks the truth. Injustice is injustice, no matter who commits it. So the Prophet rebukes his own men. He says, مَا بَالَ أَقْوَامٍ بَلَغَ بِهُمُ الْقَتْلِ إِلَىٰ أَنْ قَتَلُوا الذُرِّيَّةِ What is wrong with these people? What is wrong with those who were so excessive in their killing that they ended up killing children? They killed women and children. Do not kill women and children. Do not kill the offspring, the young offspring of these mushrikeen. The Prophet emphasized that he repeated it. Don't kill women and children. Some of the companions, they objected to the Prophet. They asked, Why should we not kill these pagan children. Aren't they not the children of pagans? Look at what the Prophet says. Isn't it not that some of the best among you, my companions, were once the children of pagans? So many of the great Sahaba, their parents were pagans. So why are you punishing them for what their parents are? Maybe these young kids will grow up and become mu'mineen. So the Prophet ﷺ, he ordered that no child, woman, or old man, or even a captive should be killed. So following the, the conflict, the, Pro, the Prophet ﷺ, troubled by the sight of a deceased woman on the battlefield, he sees a dead woman on the battlefield. He asks, who killed this woman? How did she die? The Prophet ﷺ, he's informed that this woman was killed by Khalid ibn al-Walid. The Prophet ﷺ, he rebukes Khalid and he emphasizes, he gives a very clear directive and instruction to Khalid saying that women, children and servants are not to be targeted. Now the historical context of the seerah 
elucidates an absence of a distinct concept of civilians during warfare. You know, in the, in the time of Jahiliyyah, and even in the early Sira, the Mushrikeen, they did not have this concept of, you know, civilians, that we shouldn't hurt civilians in battle. Regardless of age or gender, there was a lack, you know, before the Prophet's teachings, there was a lack of recognized protected status amidst battle engagements. So in war, the Arabs did not have this idea of individuals who were to be protected. So in this instance, the Prophet ﷺ, he sought to formalize a fundamental principle of warfare, and that is the prohibition of causing harm to civilians. And this is something, unfortunately, that is very, it's very relevant to what is happening in the world today. So even though we live in a world where we have, there's a lot of talk and rhetoric about human rights and civilian rights, but unfortunately, uh, it's not really uh, observed. It's not really put into practice. But when you look at the, the Prophet ﷺ, he was very adamant and he emphasized very much on the importance of protecting civilians during times of battle and war. Inshallah, in our next episode, uh, we'll explore some of the, the events relating to the aftermath of the Battle of Hunayn. Inshallah, we'll cover that in detail. Thank you so much, brothers and sisters, for, for tuning in. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless all of you. And I hope that you join us for our upcoming episodes on the life of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa alayhi Muhammad. Uh, thank you for the lecture, Shaykh. There's a question. Uh, just ask me if you could give a quick reminder, a refresher on uh, why the Battle of Hunayn was fought. So the Battle of Hunayn was fought because there are two tribes, two main tribes that refused to surrender to the Prophet and they were angered over the fact that Mecca was now being controlled by the Muslims. Because Mecca, prior to the conquest of the Prophet, it was basically the capital of paganism. The, the Kaaba was filled with, with idols. So Banu Thaqif, you know, who are based in Ta'if, you know, Ta'if was probably the second most, the second major city of polytheism and paganism. So Banu Thaqif, they were militarily more advanced than Quraysh. So they're thinking to themselves that, okay, Mecca now has fallen into the hands of the Muslims. Now they're implementing this concept of monotheism. They're destroying the heritage of our forefathers. We want to preserve the religion of our forefathers. And we also want to seize control over the, the Kaaba, the Quraysh. They basically have been defeated. This is an opportunity for us to take the mantle of paganism and drive out the Prophet once and for all. So in their minds, okay, Quraysh couldn't defeat the Muslims, but we have better fighters and we have a chance to gain this honor of being the custodians of the Kaaba. Does that make sense? Thank you very much. And it's surprising to see that the pagans were able to field an army of about 20,000 people uh, when like, uh, during the Battle of the Trench, a 10,000-person army was considered unprecedented. What made it possible for them to field such a large army? So you, you have to remember that in all of the battles, you know, you look at the Battle of Badr, Uhud, um, and Ahzab, the main, the primary uh, antagonists are the Quraysh. So the mushrikeen who are fighting the Prophet are primarily from 
the tribe of Quraysh, and then you might have some small tribes here and there. Banu Thaqif, they stayed out of it. You know, they're in Ta'if, they weren't really directly involved. Hawazin also, you know, they they did not really get involved. Because again, Banu Thaqif and Quraysh, they're rivals. So why should they go to battle alongside with Quraysh against the, the Muslims? They didn't see the point in putting, uh, you know, taking that risk. So why should they do the dirty work of the of the Quraysh, who are their rivals? So they stayed out of it. And Hawazin was the same. You know, they didn't see any benefit, uh, pro probably because of their own alliance with uh, Banu Thaqif. So, so that's why uh, the numbers, you know, were were, were not more than 10,000 10, was unprecedented. Um, but now that there's this golden opportunity, Banu Thaqif is saying, okay, let's bring let's bring together all of our men and let's form an alliance with Hawazin. And they probably came to some agreement that if we seize control of uh, the of Mecca and we become the custodians of the of the Kaaba. And of course, be, being the custodians of the Kaaba is a massive, massive uh, uh, economic uh, reward because you basically control Hajj, the pilgrims. I mean, you you, you control the most important uh, uh, business hub in the Arabian Peninsula. So they felt that it was worth it to pull together all of their military resources and form all of these alliances to engage in you know one final showdown uh, uh, between uh, paganism and monotheism. That's uh, really interesting. And uh, kind of going back to the story of the hanging tree, yeah, uh, kind of the the forming the religious traditions or, or following the religious traditions of others. Part, is the statement that you're trying to make that like we shouldn't be following the traditions of other religions at all, or is it that that following them is intrinsically breaking Allah's uh, rules, or is it when they cause you to break? Allah's yeah, rules? yeah. So I mean, you know, sometimes, you know, as long as these religious uh, traditions are not a promotion of false ideologies it would be okay as long as you're not engaging in anything uh that is so if if you know following or participating in religious celebrations of other groups entails you committing haram for example you know sitting at a table where wine is being served or or dancing or you know you know touching non-mahrams obviously that's going to be haram but even if you're not doing that and your participation and your celebration is a form of advocacy for 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 beliefs that contradict Islamic beliefs. You know, we're not allowed to promote um, polytheism, for example. We're not allowed to promote beliefs and ideas that that are prohibited in Islam. Does that make sense? Ah, yes, thank you. Yeah, even the, the story of the hanging tree just sounded like just kind of was drawing mental images of a Christmas tree. Yeah, when I was reading that, that's all <laughs> that's also what what came to mind. Um, you know, sometimes we think that these things are, you know, they're harmless, but I think we have to really ask ourselves, you know, why are we so um, inclined to engage in in these practices that have no connection to Islam, but when it comes to our own religious uh, holidays, there's uh, you don't see the same enthusiasm. Why is that? Is it because we're we feel inferior to these other uh, traditions? So I think a lot. I think a lot of it has to do with just a lack of proper. Islamic education, uh, kind of a, a diminishing of the Muslim identity, right? and I think a lot of this has roots in in uh, the imperialist and the uh, 
the uh, colonialist uh, projects. I think a lot of Muslims, especially in the West, they've they've kind of internalized, uh, uh, you know, this this colonized mindset. They, their minds and their hearts are colonized, and they they have this uh, feeling of inferiority and this constant need to assimilate and and blend in and appear. Uh, like they, you know, they belong to these other traditions. And there's a lot of romanticizing that happens of the, like, Christian traditions in the media and everything, which everyone keeps seeing, but you don't get similar romanticizing of our own traditions. Exactly, exactly. And I, and I think that we have a role to play in, uh, in kind of, you know, reviving the things that Islam wants us to celebrate. You know, why are we celebrating things that are, have no religious significance and are historically inaccurate. <laughs> we know for a fact that Jesus was not born on December 25th, yet it's as if there's a deliberate um, ignoring of, of reality, disregard for reality. And that's not, that's not what the prophet taught. The prophet wanted us to be people, rational people, people who are rooted in things that have a basis in reality, not to be people who celebrate things that are superstitious and fictitious and are ahistorical. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of things that the mushrikeen used to do that were that were uh, superstitious, and the Prophet sallallahu condemned it. I mean, one of the the purposes of Islam is to get rid of these nonsensical things and replace it with meaningful connections with with God and with other human beings, instead of living, you know, in, in these delusions. Thank you. And now in the Battle of Hunain, was is the is the Sunni version of the people who fled versus those who stayed behind the same, or do they have a slightly different narrative over there? I mean, like I mean, with it, it is the same, but again, depending on who the historian is, there's going to be less emphasis on. The names of of the individuals who fled. So even though it is understood that you know some of the prominent companions uh, did uh, retreat, you'll find that in 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 the in in Shi'i kind of uh, accounts, you know Shi'i historians will will point out that you know the individuals who put themselves put themselves forward as the protectors and the custodians of Islam itself, they they did not prioritize the safety of the Prophet. That is not obviously not going to be brought to the forefront. Whereas, you know, the role of Ali ibn Abi Talib, unfortunately, uh, as we see in, in many of the uh, historical writings, they don't really emphasize how uh, integral Ali ibn Abi Talib's role was, how pivotal his role was, uh, in this battle, so it's uh, so sometimes it's 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 really about what's what's omitted and what's not emphasized is really where you see the difference. But there there seems to be uh, agreement in terms of uh, you know who's who stayed behind and and who fled. Um, but there, I mean, there's there's there might be some debate about the names of those who remained. I mean, Sheikh Al Mufid says that nine out of the ten were. Beni Hashim, and we know for a fact that you know the first three Khulafa were not from from Beni Hashim, so it's implied. But um, but again, it's uh, it's something that uh, is not going to be as emphasized in terms of you know talking about you know the individuals who actually fled. And this is just another example of. Why only Ali ibn Abi Talib is the is suitable to act as the successor of the Prophet? Because I mean, how how are you going to represent the Prophet and be the protector of his tradition if you are running away, if you're escaping? Ali ibn Abi Talib never ran. You know, it, it, protecting Islam and the Prophet was always the number one priority. So how is it that someone who prioritizes his own personal safety? Is now elevated to the the level of being Khalifa to Rasulullah and the defender and the protector of Islam, right? Mm -hmm. 
So, so I think you, the different, the main difference is on on emphasis. You know, what 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 aspect of the battles are being emphasized, and unfortunately, the role of Ali is often downplayed. 